Hi, I'm Selena from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester, and I'm here with Phyllis Wong, who is a debut author of a nonfiction book, and she's going to tell you all about it. It's a very interesting nonfiction book, um, and uh, well, Phyllis, why don't you why don't you tell everybody about it? Thank you, thank you, Selena, for having me. This book, we kept our towns going, is a history of factory workers, women who worked in the factory as peace workers. It's a story that resonates across America, but especially in New England. It's a story of women who literally kept their towns going. They lived in an area where um, mining was prevalent and um, they helped take care of their families and their communities with their work. They did this for almost six decades in the 20th century at a time when women were not expected to have two jobs, one homemaker, the other one working outside of the house, but they did. They made money and the book documents through their stories, how they were empowered economically, socially, and politically. Wow. So what do you think draws readers to these kinds of books? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. It's story. History is the story of human beings, what they did. And what this book offers readers are many, many stories by women workers of what it was like to work as a peace rate worker in a small town. Okay, so um, what was the inspiration for, for We Kept Our Towns Going? And mm -hmm. what were the steps that you, t that you took to bring it from uh, uh, the initial inspiration to a finished product? Sure. So the, the, the inspiration goes as far back as 2010, when I was a guest speaker at Northern Michigan University in Marquette, Michigan. I was invited to be a guest speaker during Women's History Month. And I had been giving presentations about this piece of history for a, a few years. I brought women that I had interviewed to this presentation. And at the end of the interview, guests, those present, asked questions of those women. It was a marvelous discussion. But at one point, uh, one of the workers, her response to the question, um, not everyone there shared her point of view. And so someone actually out loud, one of the other workers out loud said something. That's not how it happened. What happened as a result of that is that I could see in the audience, people were paying attention. Two people that worked at the same factory, factory had differing views. And so I thought to myself, this is an important this is important for people to hear. Not everyone has the same point of view and the strength of history is hearing the collective voices where possible. So when I left that talk, and that was after, again, a woman had brought a box up to me with fabric, leftover fabric from this factory. The box went with me to other talks and kept festering in my mind about this story needs to be told. And Phyllis, these women's stories, more than one woman can tell this story. So I kept this idea in my head and I was able to listen to many different stories. And that's why this book is so important. And so you asked, after that, how else did I keep going? Well, I kept going because I kept interviewing people. I kept learning and learning and learning. 
an understanding that this is a complex story and yet in its complexity, there were some common threads. The people, the women knew that what they did had an impact on their families and the local communities. So mm -hmm. I kept doing that and, you know, I just sort of stuck with it, kept sticking with it. Uh-huh. So, um, so you found that this particular subject um, really piqued your interest rather than other subjects in, in history? I suppose so. It goes back to the simple, again, this simple idea that this was an unusual story and it had not been told. And I, was and I was unaware of other histories that were told through multiple voices. Mm -hmm. So, and your your background, um, it's history, isn't it? it? History and literature, American history and American literature, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so what kind of research, um, aside from going to, to different people, talking to them, went into this book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um. I had to go read newspapers, old newspapers. And at the time, these newspapers were accessible either via microfiche or reading the actual newspaper themselves. So this was a very, also another very laborious process of reading through newspapers. I had the good fortune of um, reading letters. But honestly, a lot, I owe a huge debt of gratitude to one woman in particular. Her name is Elaine Peterson. She's one of the workers, a woman who worked in every facet of that factory in Ishpeming. And so individual people who had more information were very helpful to me, but really just the interviews and, and, re and research and particularly letters, um, during the eight years in which organizing went on at Ishpeming's factory. Gwyn was not organized, organizing, but Ishpeming was. Mm -hmm. So I should mention that this book um, um, has stories from women who worked in two factories in, in Marquette County, Ishpeming and Gwyn. These were small towns. Is it in Pennsylvania? No, in, in Marquette, Michigan. Oh, Michigan. Yes. Oh, I don't know why I thought it was Pennsylvania. Yeah. No, in, in Ishpeming. Very unusual in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. A place where Mother Nature, not human nature, dominates. Aha. Uh -huh. Yeah. Okay. Did you have any um any favorite research stories? Any favorite research stories? Well, I think I should mention again Elaine Peterson because she was a woman who uh, had great had worked there a very long time in many different areas. Um, so her discussions about what it was like to go on strike for sixteen weeks as wow. a young woman, twenty years old, and to be on the negotiating committee to try and bring the women's voices to management so that they would have a union shop. So Elaine Peterson was pretty amazing. Um, probably the most interesting research are those of the stories of the variety of women. A woman who was an immigrant from Brussels, Bel I'm sorry, Belgium. Um, her story about taking a boat during World War II back to the States as a war bride. Wow. So I don't know that I have um, favorite stories. It's sort of, I would really say the collective voices, they are fascinating stories. Wow. Um, so what else can we expect from you in the near future? 
Well, I, that's a really good question. I, I am, <clears throat> I have learned that it's story that people enjoy. So what are some other stories of history, untold stories right. that I can help bring to life? And I'm not in a position to name, to give you any more information, but there is a local story that I hope as a new newcomer to Worcester, that I hope that I can learn about and bring and bring out. I am also, I have also written books for my grandchildren. So I'm actually going to be writing another children's book about a special character called Mungo Moose. Um, so that really is my next book. I will publish it myself. I'm not going to uh, take it to a publisher. But, uh, oh, great. I will be doing that, yes. Yeah, there's there's a lot of history in Worcester. There's definitely a lot to you know, to, to, to discover. You are absolutely right. I have lived in many different areas of the United States, but never in an area where history is as deep as it is in Worcester. And what's wonderful to see are the obvious um, landmarks around the city, stories in the newspaper, um, Worcesterites, can I use that word? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Worcesterite, Worcesterites treasure their history, and I'm very, very glad for that. I am learning about right. Worcester history. Right. Okay. Now I have some questions for you about being a writer, um, even though this is your debut book. Mm -hmm. um, but what is your favorite part? What was your favorite part of, of being a writer on, on the whole writing and uh, publishing process? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the most favorite part were the hours and hours of listening to the recordings. Not all were recorded, some were just handwritten, but listening and listening and listening. And in doing so, getting closer to understanding and appreciating um, the work that these women did. So it really is the interviews. And then figuring out how, how, to, how to showcase, how to spotlight these stories in a way that would captivate readers. That was not easy to do. Hmm. And that was your favorite part of it. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And uh, what do you consider the most challenging part of the writing process? Well, one of the pieces that was the most challenging for me was after I had found a publisher. And... Um, I had just heard back from readers. I had sent chapters to people. And so I approached a publisher. And in the process of going through and them accepting the, the uh, manuscript, they wanted me to change the format of the manuscript. I, I am a new author. It's already scary enough writing a book. <laughs> the first time. So I was committed to getting these women's stories out. And I was committed to listening to publishers. They knew what they were doing. So I had to change a manuscript that was formatted by theme and topics into a chronological format. Why was that difficult? Well, I suppose, again, I go back to the idea that the interviews were still remain the most challenging and the most rewarding piece of work of the book. The book was divided chronologically by decade. But the interviews I had, I had written up multiple times were not organized by time but by jobs. 
-hmm. Plus, it was important to make sure that everybody who talked to me, their voices were recognized in the book. That's a lot of people, mm -hmm. lots of people. Some of the stories were longer than others. And I felt it was important to provide long biographies so that readers would know the context, for example, of a woman who told me about working in the Gwyn factory the whole time that the factory was open. She showed me the indentation on her hand from working seven hours a day. Now, maybe the reader wouldn't understand that as well as if they knew that th she had to work. She had to provide for her family. So working there was important. She was good at it, one of the fastest peace workers, but she had to work. So providing these little details about the context of the Richards to the large story is helpful for readers. So every chapter has at least one, multiple full biographies. Uh, I had to advocate for these full biographies. Um, some people felt that I shouldn't have had so many. I can understand that. But I also understand the importance of these, of hearing the voices cross-section of many different workers and community members. Mm, yeah, I mean, maybe they were thinking that you, you, maybe they were thinking that maybe you shouldn't have, might have listened to all of them, but maybe put, not put everything in there. I, I don't know. Well, and, and I didn't, I had to oh, edit really? many of them. Oh my gosh, yes, lots of editing took place. Again, why? Well, we can't say tell the same story in the same way each time in the book. Mm, that's true. Absolutely. You know, thinking about the audience that I didn't know but was hopeful for, it was important to consider how these stories, how they might read these stories. Mm -hmm. Very true. So what was your favorite adventure um, during your short writing career <laughs> um there are many adventures i think one in particular i'd like to mention is that um when i left i lived in the upper peninsula and that's how i discovered this story okay mm -hmm. um and then at some point my husband and i moved to the west coast for work um, and but I would still go back to the Upper Peninsula to do research and write. Um, the Upper Peninsula is a magical place, according to me. And uh, I would always go and visit during the season of white winter. I knew that I could think things through easily if I was moving my body and walking. So one day, it was very early in the morning, barely sunrise, and it was a snowstorm. I got out of my car and I walked on my favorite path near Lake Superior and it got worse and worse and I was unable to move because I couldn't see forward, backward, or sideways. I knew the path, but you couldn't see, so you didn't know where to go. And in that moment, I was it was very peaceful and calm. Not even the birds were singing. Wow. And, but yet that was a moment in which I could think about the challenges of the day and the peace that I was working on. So some people I know like to have music and silence and or different things when they are writing. I don't have a preference. My most, my preferred preference is moving, walking. 
for some reason, you know, the, the brain relaxes and uh, you figure, th I figure things out. Huh. I walk many miles. Interesting. So y you weren't actually writing things down, but you were just writing in your mind, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So <sighs> you went after you, you were writing these things down, um, after you were, were um, thinking of, of all of these things, um, did you come up with a, a uh, an outline for your book? Yes. Okay, yes. so you knew exactly how it was going to... I, I had a, a primitive outline. <clears throat> but the other thing that I know about myself as a writer... Outlines are good, but beyond that, I do my best writing by just starting to write. Okay. I don't know where it will go. Mm -hmm. And, but I do know that if I stick with it, I learn more, I know more, I write more. Mm hmm. Okay. So what is the greatest lesson that you've learned thus far um, in your writing career? The greatest lesson. Well, since um, I, I'd like to speak, first of all, to this book. The greatest lesson that I learned in writing this book is an idea that I, I'm sure others have come up with this idea, that you will never know what someone is thinking unless you give them a voice. Mm. This is a history told through the voices of many, many people. Having said that, the being persistent, persevering, resilient and knowing that a book gets done by starting to write just writing that's how a book gets done so um what piece of advice would you want to share with other writers is is that the main piece of advice Just write. Just write. Keep writing. Write some more. Mm -hmm. Put words when, on paper. <laughs> put it. Yes. Put it on paper. When it's on paper, then it's no longer up here. And what does that mean? That means when you go back to it, you now can put, there's something else up here that can go down on the paper. Right. Okay. Yes. Writing is hard. Using words. Once you put the words on the paper, there it is. There's nothing else. Those words. But if we go back, we might see something else that maybe the word gets changed or maybe we add more. I don't know why I'm thinking about this, Selena, but... In an interesting way, writing this book was like, um, with words, creating this um, quilt. Hmm. Figuring out what pieces, what the shapes of the pieces are, how they fit into this large picture called We Kept Our Towns Going. Hmm. Okay, very interesting. Hmm. I have some questions for you now about you as a person. Mm -hmm. um, what's one thing that most people don't realize about you? Winter is my favorite season. Um, I did, don't come to winter naturally. I was not raised in an environment that had four distinct seasons. But 
when my husband and I moved to Marquette, Michigan, um, from the very first time, my first interaction with their season of white, I was captivated. I am a photographer, amateur one, and uh, white snow is so sculptural, beautiful, beautiful. So yes, I love the season of white. Okay. So what um, what is or are your passions uh, when you're not writing and how do you make time for them? When I'm not writing, I love to hike. I love to garden. I love inventing new recipes. <laughs> I love reading to my grandchildren. I love creating stories, oral stories with my grandchildren. Okay, that sounds great. Um, and you already mentioned that uh, you you prefer when you're writing, um, you prefer to be moving. Um, so it, you um but when you're actually sitting down writing um and putting putting things to paper or uh or to computer um do you prefer music or silence i don't have a preference okay i i find that when i'm in the zone i'm in the zone whether there's silence or music or which did happen my youngest grandson would play in my office while I was writing. <laughs> he wanted to be playing in an area where there was, I suppose, an adult or a grandparent nearby. Oh, wow. And you could actually yeah. concentrate? Um, I could. I could, yes. I know that sounds interesting, different but I could. So you have an office. What is your, what does your writing space look like? <laughs> Controlled chaos. <laughs> so I know that um, everybody is different. I don't have to have things orderly. I have piles everywhere, but I know what's in the pile. Um, while writing, and it still is there, I have a wall that's um, uh, dedicated to uh, the book because there were about a hundred people I had to think about. Um, I created some uh, spreadsheets of them, their years, what they did. Um, so my wall is, as I'm looking at it right now, it's mostly covered with paper. Okay. <laughs> Um, and writers often have furry or feathered or otherwise non-human companions um, to help them through their work. And do you have any and uh, do they help you or uh, hinder you? <laughs> I have no furry companions anywhere. What I do have on my wall are lovely illustrations written by my drawn by my grandchildren of how they viewed the cover of my book, what it should look like. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of engaging, especially young people in the idea of writing a book. I don't know how many young people know authors. My grandchildren did not know any, so it was pretty exciting for them. And that excitement and the excitement by family in general and friends in general is something that motivates one. It motivated me to keep going, to keep telling, to keep trying, keep trying. Hmm. That's interesting. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I just have two more questions for you. 
Um, mm -hmm. Where can people find your work aside from Annie's Bookstop of Worcester? And this is where I always give a plug for Annie's. Um, you can uh, you can get we kept our towns going at Annie's and uh, you can call us at 508-796-5613 or you can email us at orders at anniesbooksworcester.com. And where else could people find your books? First of all, I want to thank Annie's and you for um, providing this book for people who want to get the book. Other places within Worcester, are, are these small places, neighborhood bookstores. There's two very fine ones, um, Rutan Press on Chandler Street, as well as Tidepool Books at the other end of Chandler Street. And the library. Mm -hmm. People can check the book out of our public library. We should not forget our public libraries. They're wonderful places. Okay. And how can we follow your work and share your awesomeness? Mm -hmm. This is probably where I have fallen a bit short, Selena. I have been so busy. I do not have a web page yet. But I did learn the other day um, that one can go online. And if you put in the title of the book, one will be amazed at the plethora of bookstores that are carrying the book. Um, Wikipedia provides some information about the book and a little bit about Phyllis. Uh, so regrettably, as of today, I don't have anything. I will be working on it. Okay. Sounds good. Well, thank you very much for, for joining me and uh, Phyllis Wong. And um, since you live in Worcester, I expect that we will be seeing you sometime at the store. Most assuredly, I will be at Annie's store. If invited to for a book signing, I will do that. But most importantly, I value what Annie provides for readers in Worcester, new and used books. So um, I, I came, I visited Annie's when I first moved to Worcester. I will continue to visit Annie's. Thank you to you and to the owners of Annie's. I deeply appreciate it. Okay, well, thank you very much. And we All will right. be seeing you. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> Bye.